I want to also, I, I didn't mention it, but I, I talked about the chancellor's office. But the, this, this program is sponsored um, by, in addition to the, the deans and the schools, by the office of the chancellor and the Rutgers University Cultural Programming Committee. So I wanted to make sure to acknowledge them. Um, at this point, I'd like to actually invite our, um, our, our panelists and our moderator um, to the stage. Um, if we can just give them a round of applause as they walk, walk up here. Um, And, and what I'd like to do is I am going to uh, introduce the moderators, and then the moderators will introduce the panelists. Um, we have about um, a 30-minute uh, panel, which is not a lot of time for these amazing um, women that are up here. Um, but, and we will have a short time for Q&A um, at the end. So if you, you should have received um, or you will receive cards if anybody has some questions that they might want to write down, um, the staff will come around and collect those from you. Um, but uh, first I'd like to um, introduce Fayemi Shakur, um, who is, a, yes, who is a, um, a writer, cultural critic, and curator residing in Newark, New Jersey. Currently, she is a visiting lecturer at Rutgers University Newark's Department of Art, Culture, and Media, right here. Um, and she's also, which I love, the 2019 Feminist in Residence at Project for Empty Space Gallery in Newark. Um, so let's give her a round of applause. Um, there's so much more about her, but all of the bios are in the program. Um, and then our, our next um, moderator um, over here is, uh, Emily Karras, who is a poet and educator, originally from LA, um, and she's currently an MFA candidate in poetry at Rutgers University in Newark, where she also teaches English composition. So thank you all for being here. Okay, I am in heaven. Anytime I am in a room with people who love and respect women, I am in heaven. So thank you for joining us in heaven today. <laughs> I have the honor of introducing our panelists. I'm gonna start with Jordan Castile in the center. Um, you can check your programs to read their full bios, but I'll just give you a little snippet. Jordan is an assistant professor of painting in the Department of Arts, Culture, and Media here at Rutgers Newark. And she also just had a fabulous solo exhibition I wish I could have attended at the Denver Art Museum in Colorado. She's been receiving incredible press in Vogue and The Roots and congratulations to you. And her students adore her, I hear it all the time. So thank you for joining us, Jordan. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Next is Salome Shatillet, who is currently the Henry Rutgers Chair of African American Studies and Creative. Okay, that's better? Okay. The Henry Rutgers Chair of African American Studies and Creative Writing, founding director of the New Arts Social Justice Initiative at Express Newark and the Associate Director of the Clement Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern, Amer the Modern Experience, African American and Studies. Oh, oh my eye glasses. <laughs> They're good for you. In, in short, Salamisha is dope. Salam <laughs> she's, she's incredible. I'm not done. She's the co-founder of A Long Walk Home, which um, her sister here, Shirazadeh is um, the executive director of. And if you haven't, I, I encourage you just to Google all the work, tremendous work that they have done through that organization, A Long Walk Home. They've both been incredibly instrumental in the Mute R. Kelly campaign, providing support to survivors. And in addition to that, Salamisha is also working on two books, one on Nina Simone and another in Search of the Color Purple, about Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Um, uh, Shirazadeh, uh, she has an <laughs> exhibition on view at Express Newark 
on um, Nina Simone. She's also an incredible photographer. So thank you all for joining us here today. As we have heard from the introductions, this is a day dedicated to how women and individuals who identify as women use art as a medium for activacy. So Fayemi and I were curious, who are some of the women that have inspired you, have been foundational to your studies and practice, and in particular women who currently inspire your work today? I, I, I will jump in, I guess. <laughs> um, so I... I so loud with this. I'm gonna pull this out. I'm already really loud, so it doesn't help if the microphone is all in my face. But um, I saw that question and was so excited about it because I couldn't help but think of the early women in my life who helped ignite my vision of myself and my sense of confidence. And those were my real inspirers early on. I talk about my mother as having a community of mothers. There's a tribe that has raised me, all of her friends, the friends' friends, the people who have told me to like, step forward and do the thing that I love um, with reminders that I have wings when I forgot that they were there. Um, and there are, so my mother is one of them, but then I got to grad school or I was just looking around my own communities and there were a lot of artists that um, stood out to me. The first artist that I got to know was Micheline Thomas. I, I was looking at Figuration and um, her play with material was really exciting to me and she continues to be an inspiration. Um, Alice Neal, Carrie Mae Weems, Henry Taylor, well that's a woman, a man, um, Lynette Yodomboyke, like she is a boss who inspires me all the time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm surrounded by inspirational women. Yeah, um, okay, I feel like maybe I have, I have the opposite issue with my mic. Um, <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, so my name is Shaharazad, but um, I'm an artist, I'm a photographer, I'm also really incredibly um, inspired by what we just witnessed yeah. because I'm an art therapist, so I consider myself a healer, and at Roots, I'm an activist. And so I think I've been um, also influenced by similar artists as you who are at the peak of creating an aesthetic with their artists, at, um, like having like an, a high aesthetic of art, but also holding a high aesthetic of activism. So, I mean, I, I think we, we overlap with McLean yes. and like, we, like who is the muse yep. and, and reclaiming who's the muse. So my work is centering black girls and black women and, and their stories and archiving that um, and holding that. But also um, I'm thinking about um, Elizabeth Catlick um, who, is an incredible like sculptor and and um, you know just has a high but also was did all the posters did posters for the Black Panthers you know um, and so like to hold both is very important and I just want to mention one other person like who isn't um, Alice Walker um, and for Alice Walker and, and Salmisha will talk probably I don't know because um, she's searching for Alice Walker through her new book. But um, I got to photograph Alice Walker um, with Salamisha very recently in the fall. And it, it was through her as a healer um, that how she holds space, how she thinks about space. And just like she was like, a, for all of us, I think she has, she has influenced us with her writing. And, um, but I think like she was almost like this connection that we had was like a, a grandmother that I never had. There was like this spiritual connection. Um, and, and just, you know, you just, the advice that she gave, you just, whatever, when you're around her, you just wanna like hold and hold that moment in a bottle, you know, um, and forever. So I think, you know, these things rotate with me, but, um, and I just wanna put one more other person out there. It would be Rosa Parks. And it isn't for Rosa Parks because of how we know Rosa Parks, but I think it's Rosa Parks because there's a story and narrative about Rosa Parks that needs to be reclaimed, right? Of who she was in terms of being an old woman on a bus, that she was an incredible activist um, long before that moment, 
that she was an advocate for women, particularly uh, sexual assault victims. Um, and so I think that the idea of t who's telling the story for us, and as an artist, it's like um, important for me to like reclaim and tell those stories and hold the stories, and as a teacher for young girls to like, for them to tell their own stories. So I, th I, I hold Rosa Parks in that way. It's always fun, because I never know what Shahrazad's going to say. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's great. Thank you, everyone, for doing this. Um, and uh, as always, I'm always so impressed with Rutgers Newark. I thought we were going to be on like a table and just <laughs> talking to each other. I didn't know it would be this grant. So thank you so much for inviting me and for this beautiful celebration of women here in the community um, and um, on our campus. So I guess I come to this question through different avenues. I'm a kind of a composite as I'm an academic and as an artist and as an activist. So I'll kind of just highlight different people who have influenced me at different moments. Um, I think, and this is a question I think we're going to return to, but what, how do we practice feminism? But it, it would be hard for me not to say that a lot of my feminism comes from uh, my sister as like actual living, breathing role model who's inspired me in different ways. So, so there's that, so Shahrazad, um, who's sitting on the stage. Um, but also, I grew up, um, uh, writing and reading were my primary ways of understanding the vocabulary of feminism. Like I always think I was, as a child, as a girl, pretty gender non-conforming and, and had a mother and an aunt who, um, in many ways, resisted patriarchal norms, even as they were, you know, in some ways subscribing to them. So I think my aunt and my mother were really important in terms of that as well. And beautiful women and really into uh, the arts. My mother's a, a musician. Um, but in terms of uh, my, when I was 16 years old, I read three books. So um, this is kind of like a formative part of my development. Um, Malcolm X's autobiography, um, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, and Alice Walker's The Color Purple. And so I think that combination sent me on a path that at the time I didn't realize was going to be about how do you wrestle with these questions of racial injustice and gender inequality at once. And so I would say that Alice Walker and Toni Morrison, very different kinds of writers and very different activists in the world, um, had, put an, had an imprint on me at such a young age. And then at the same time, I. Um, so I went to school here in New Jersey, and we had to do this thing called like senior project or senior year, and I interned at NOW, um, and I had the opportunity of meeting Gloria Steinem then, who's become a mentor to me as an adult. So in that, that senior year of high school, like really changed my life, and I, I think that set me on a, on a path of activism. And then later on, I found different models. Um, in graduate, an undergrad, Fair Jasmine Griffin, who's a professor at Columbia, uh, gave me permission to imagine myself as a professor who looked a particular way, who had a particular set of um, political um, concepts and ideologies, but who also was really committed to speaking and writing in a language that people could understand. And I saw her practice that um, every day and every time I had access to her. And then when I became a professor, I was at Penn before coming here, uh, Thaddeus Davis, who's a literary critic, um, who really modeled feminism and black feminism and modeled how to navigate the world of academia and institutional power. So in real time, I've had so many different kinds of um, models, but I would say uh, if I could list like the top five, those are the ones. And then of course, Nina Simone, who I discovered without her being in my life um, physically, but I discovered her sonically and aesthetically um, and her deep commitment to uh, her sacrifice of using her voice and her music to help change the world and her friendships with Lorraine Hansberry and, and James Baldwin um, inspire me, even though I think I'm a very different type of person uh, than Nina Simone, as Marsha can attest to, uh, since I heard another Nina Simone story today. So these are just the models I work with and get inspired by. Thank you, excellent. So my next question is, Related, exactly related to what you're saying. In art and activism circles, you know, we talk a lot about centering, right? And voices and narratives, as you all have been discussing. And so I wanted to ask you about uh, representation and why representation is important today. And also, who are you interested in centering in your work at this moment? 
So I am a painter um, and have been practicing as a painter for the past five, six years or so. I was always a maker, my mother would say, in her journals when I was six months old. There was an attention to color and my use of hands was an important part of who I was. Um, but as a painter who came, so I grew up in Denver, Colorado, um, and then I went to a small liberal arts women's college in Georgia called Agnes Scott. Uh, going to a women's college was not on my radar. I was terrified of relationships with women, quite frankly, because I had two brothers and I was just like raised by boys. Um, and I realized very quickly being in a community of women that I could exercise my voice and that voice could have power um, and meaning. That I had a space to fill and to stand in that space was gonna be utterly important for the rest of my life. But I also discovered painting when I was in college. Um, but then I got into Yale, which was like this whole other story and journey. And when I got there, I, the censorship part of like who I was and what it was that I was trying to represent um, was a head-on experience for me. That I was painting um, brown people, black people. Um, I was painting black men primarily. Uh, and my critiques would look like, like, when are you gonna, why aren't you painting white people, you know? Um, I very much remember somebody saying that explicitly and thinking like, wait, what? The, the white guy over there is doing self-portraits all the time. No one's asking him when he's gonna paint like a black person. You know what I mean? Like it was like the centering of me as being like the holder of um, other people's narratives as opposed to my own um, was something that I was confronted with really early on and I made a really, specific and distinct gesture that it was important that I was a woman painting or switching the gaze onto the male body. And the black male body in particular is, as a body and a person is communities that I have loved, that it is literally and physically my family. Um, and what does it look like to be a woman in relationship to uh, a man, to have the feminist or f female lens um, in relationship to that body? Uh, and then it just has kind of continued and one of the greatest criticisms or comments or things for the first part of my career was uh, now you only paint black men. And I remember being on a panel kind of like this, but it was all men. And I, I, that's when I got that question for the first time. It was a young woman who stood up in the front and asked the question, when are you gonna paint us? And I said, I need you to see me up here right now and not forget that I am the maker of this work. I felt it is important that you see me um, because I think it's really easy to forget that my hands, everything is being filtered through my lens. That this work that I'm making very much holds the feminine for me. That I don't look at this work as holding an absence. I see it as quite the antithesis actually. And um, all too often people forget that we are the, the energy and the power behind um, many of the things that people are seeing and engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis. So people would walk into my show and say, um, where is he? Um, and my mother loved being able to say, well, she's over there, you know? I'm like, that's my daughter. And they'd be like, what? Like, over, I'd be like, hi. <laughs> um, but I think it's important that people remember that, that that's, those processes have kind of occurred over time as I realize that I get jut up against histories that people don't make assumptions that a young black woman is making monumental work. And what you're really talking about, too, is your ability to shape conversation yeah, yeah. through your work. Yeah. And that's powerful yeah. to acknowledge that agency that you do have and that we all have that ability to shape conversation. Yeah. Salamisha? Yeah, I was thinking about the verb censor and I guess to piggyback on what Jordan was saying, like I think I'm interested in centering and decentering. I don't think of the work I do. So I, you know, <laughs> I'm a writer and I'm a critic and so I guess that's my prime, well that it would be my primary art form. So I'm really, um, hope when an artist produces a piece of work, whether it's film or whether it's um, you know, a television show or a novel or whatever it is, that um, my eye and my explanation and my analysis of their work that they feel really um, appreciated by me um, through the process of investigating and, and teaching someone how to read this work anew. Um, and so I think that that, you know, there's a, maybe there's a, it's not a, Censoring, but there's a selection in what kinds of work that I'm interested in writing about, um, where I write and how I write and things like that. So there is that process. But I do think my kind of black feminist ethics um, is always about trying to 
um, shine light on or investigate or give um, voices that are historically marginalized um, the gift of like close reading and the gift, like similar to the work that, that you've been doing a lot too, or continue, you've been doing your whole life, but then you've also been doing um, um, with uh, the lens, like that kind of thoughtful um, engagement with someone else's artistic practice, I feel like is my way of kind of who I write about, what kind of writing I do, and the way the analysis I bring to it with a black feminist um, ideology and black feminist background um, is my way of centering things that may not historically have been taken um, as seriously as other forms of work or other uh, artists. So that's one way of doing it. Um, the other way, I guess, is like, you know, in terms of, and Cher can talk to this about this more in terms of her own practice, um, but if you're like using a black feminist framework, it's a very generous, it's very open. I mean, in the sense that it's one of the, to me, one of the more expansive ideologies out there. It encompasses and it, it values, it, it really doesn't think of people as disposable. And so once you're practicing with this idea that everyone matters, uh, that people should be valued and those who are um, treated uh, as if they are nothing, uh, which is oftentimes black people and black girls and women, um, if they should be treated with dignity and respect and their genius be acknowledged, then that kind of gives you a different set of tools to work with. So I guess that's my other approach as well. I don't, didn't, uh, I have this piece that Cher and I just worked on, um, on Nina Simone and <laughs> Alice Walker. These are the two things that are gonna be my, everything I'm talking about Alice Walker and Nina Simone for today, for the next two years probably. Um, but there's this uh, line that Alice Walker has in Search of Our Mother's Garden, that essay collection, and she says that um, a people don't throw geniuses away. And I find that really important. Um, mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. geniuses that we know and the geniuses that we have yet to acknowledge. And then the people who don't even fit into that category at all, what do we do with them? And it's important for a critic like me to come along and pay attention. So. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm like, I'm resonating. Um, <laughs> because I was trying to like tie in all of that, um, what you guys said. Um, I'm gonna just highlight like two projects, I think, that really talk about um, this confronting censorism and, and centering. Um, and so for the past, I don't know, 20 years, 20 years, I would say, um, I've been working on a project about, so, you know, like my sister and she, <laughs> she's right there. Um, but I've been photographing, um, I started in 1998, where I photographed her healing process as a survivor of sexual violence. And so this is like, obviously pre Me Too, pre, you know, um, a, a huge movement. And I, I naively didn't know that, right? Like, so I was photographing how a black woman and celebrating a black woman's healing process, you know? Um, and I transformed this, this project into a, like a multimedia performance and I went around college campuses. And in that process, it was interesting because I was trying to say that my Salamisha as a black woman could represent all women's stories, right? So like deframing what women, and at that time, I mean, and still is, women is, means white women. Um, and our, like how Me Too movement, even a movement that was created by black women had to like reclaim that space. Um, and so I think, I learned a lot of lessons that way of, of, of pushing this performance and, 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 and at a very young age and at a, at a time and a period that wasn't really ready to talk about sexual assault, let alone women of color stories about sexual assault. Um, and so, um, you know, you just kind of learn to kind of like um, create spaces, create healing spaces, create, use art for that kind of change. Um, and despite the mainstream movement that you're doing the work, you know what I mean? And, and, and I feel like that's kind of like in that way of geniusness, in that way you're waiting for, um, well, you're not really waiting, you're just gonna do the work, you know? That's the moment of activism and the movement, if it comes, it, it, it's gonna come to reach other people. Um, and so I think that brings me to the newest work, which is about black girls. Um, so I went to an exhibition about 10 years ago um, about adolescents, uh, it was all the main photographers 
and had this amazing show about like adolescence and photography. And so that's like my passion is working with young people. And I saw only a whole floor at a museum and only two photographs were of black girls. And there were very like stereotypical images. There was like a young woman who was like pregnant and then I don't even remember the other image, you know. Um, but I was just like, how can my young people that I work with, that I teach photography, that I teach, um, that become activists and activists, like see themselves? You know, I really wanted them to like see themselves. And I realized that that would not be, be created by these artists, that I would have to work with our young people to tell their own stories and for me to photograph them, you know? And so creating a new archive of like, what, what does it mean to be centered? So I guess by what, what isn't there and like using my medium, my artistry to kind of like highlight the invisible.